welcome everyone to today's session. This is a live learn session with the Local Immigration Partnership. And before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge the lands that we are on. So diversity recognizes that our work takes place on the ancestral, traditional, and unceded territories of the Semiamu, the Keitsi, the Kekwantlin, the Kwantlin, the Keikia, the Masquiam, and the Tawasan First Nations. The knowledge, traditions, and ongoing contributions of these communities are significant in providing context to the work we do, and diversity recognizes that the importance of reconciliation has in building truly inclusive and strong communities. And as we do land acknowledgments, I always say we have to think a little bit deeper as to why we do them and, and how we're, what are the part, what is the part we're playing in reconciliation in supporting our Indigenous communities as they are still working to achieve that. And so without further ado, I do want to bring attention to today's session um, with our guest speakers, Tina Bellachandran and Anna Maria um, Bas ba Basmante. Please right. correct me if I'm wrong. Basmante, <laughs> yes. yes. And Anna Maria Basmante from the Burnaby Local Immigration Partnership and Tina from the Surrey Local Immigration Partnership. I will allow these two wonderful women in the sector to introduce themselves and share a little bit about why they're here today, their role as the Local Immigration Partnership managers or coordinators. So without further ado, I'll just pass on the mic metaphorical mic to you. And, and I see as people join, welcome. And I hope you enjoyed this session. Welcome, Nusrat. Tina, so do you want to you can start? Yeah. I was Anna Maria, I think, yeah, you should go first. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, yes, my so my name is Anna Maria Bustamante. I'm originally from Colombia. I've been in in Canada 25 years. I came with my husband and my two daughters. So it's been a like everybody shares, it's been an interesting journey with up and downs, like we all have to go through, unfortunately. Um but in those processes, illnesses came through, uh, acceptance of credentials like everybody goes through. So all those pieces, we understand quite well the process that newcomers are going through. So how did I, I get it to the local immigration partnership? Well, historically, the, it was called Barnaby Intercultural Planning Table. This was the first local immigration partnerships created in BC. Uh, it was started in 2007, initially funded by the, by United Way, and then it was funded by the provincial government to the Welcome BC. At the time, uh, it was a funding coming from the federal government, but it was managed by the provincial government. Then in 2014, IRCC, the federal government decided to manage the funds directly, so we've been funded by IRCC since 2014. So while the Barnaby Intercultural Planning Table is started with 12 members, right now we are at the count of 45 organizations being part of the, of the Barnaby Intercultural Planning Table. We do the work through a, a working groups. The working groups have been created according to the strategic priorities that were selected. So we have employment, we have intercultural connections, we have civic engagement, cultural representation, and access to information. As they were identified like the top priorities that newcomers need to have on hand in, in Barnaby. So we have a, the, we do, or a part of the work that we do is participate, we do some research. Sometimes we do participate in different activities. We support the city within the members that we have. We have the city is a partner number one. We have parks and recreation. We have the public library. We do have our, all the settlement organizations, the YMCA, the YWCA, and now we have uh, three the uh, organizations for the Francophone Federation. We have Le Relais, the Société de, de Eco Development Economique, and also we have the Réseau Santé. So all of them support the, the French speakers in, a, in, in BC, as, and they are seated working with us. And we also have the Francophone Federation seated at the table. Um, outside of that, we have the RCMP that has been our number one the table since the very start the first start in 2007 and uh, so for my personal experience like i said i came to canada in, two, in 25 years ago then i it took me the three months to get my first job not in the, at the level that i was coming from i was coming no, from no. being the the, the uh, administration officer from the World, World Health organization in colombia 
And then when I landed here, I had to push back myself and become an admin assistant of a nonprofit organization here. Um, that first experience wasn't the best. Like, uh, so there was a lot of challenges, part of things, stress, uh, issues of discrimination. So that sometimes we don't get to talk about those pieces, but those are things that unfortunately we have to deal with those. And uh, then uh, sorted out, I went back to the university, did a master's program. After the master's, I decided my husband had to deal with cancer. So within those pieces, like I said, those were the ups and the really down uh, things of life. Had two daughters at the time. One was in a high school, the other one was in elementary school. So we were able to sort those things out. My husband recovered from his cancer. And uh, yeah, so life took me. I worked with AMSA, then I worked with a neighborhood house, creating all the multicultural programs for the multicultural community in the West End of Vancouver. Then I moved to a survey organization. And from after that survey organization, I found the, the possibility of being part of the LIP. That was seven years ago. And I don't change the work that I do right now for anything else. I wish, like I told my husband, I wish I would have found this job when I first landed because it totally goes with my way of thinking, the way of doing, and the compassionate and the empathy that we need to have, not only to understand ourselves, but be able to understand others in the building with, understanding their differences, and at the same time, the similarities within those differences that everybody has to go through. So as I said, I've been here for seven years, and on the side that I manage the BIPT, I manage the Barnaby Together, that's a coalition against Racism and Hate that works in collaboration with the BIPT to do EDI projects and anti-racism and discrimination. I'm going to stop here, otherwise I'm going to take all Tina's time. And Anna Maria, that is totally fine because for all of us, we can keep listening to Anna Maria all day long. There's so much knowledge. There is so much wisdom there. So thank you for starting us off uh, so beautifully, Anna Maria. Hello, everybody. It is an absolute honor uh, to be here for this engagement session. And uh, my name is Tina Balachandran. I really appreciate Sumeya thinking and bringing us together and seeing value in the work the local immigration partnerships do. I'll tell you a little bit about myself and then tell you how I got into this work and what uh, uh, our LIP does, because Anna Maria has already shared a little bit about what the LIPs do. Uh, so you'll see us use this word LIPs very often. That's because LIP is a short form for Local Immigration Partnership. Nusrat, hi, lovely to see you. You were at our Community Stakeholder Forum. Wonderful. <laughs> so my name is Tina and I arrived in Canada six years ago. Uh, July 2018 is when I arrived here with my family. Uh, uh, not knowing what I'm getting into, but very confident that I will manage uh, to have a fantastic life and all the dreams that I have, I will absolutely be able to sort of, you know, I, why should I have any challenges and problems? I'm a professionally qualified woman with 20 years of experience in television. I have run businesses. I have managed uh, companies and I have handled multiple diverse teams. I come here and the last thing that I was to worry about, which was finding a job, became the most worrisome thing for me. Uh, long story short, in about 2000 is 2020 when the COVID, when COVID struck is when I um, started my work with diversity. Before that, I was working uh, as a freelancer is what they used to say in my part of the world. But as a consultant, as a part time sort of, you know, a community worker, I used to work in community organizations <laughs> because I had done... Um, community building work, work with the not-for-profits, uh, along with my television work uh, back home in India. That's where I come from. And then I was finding a lot of value in that work. I was volunteering a lot. And I decided I got so many setbacks in the television career here that I decided I've done television for a long time, that I have a new purpose now and I want to work with immigrants and I want to work with women and youth in particular. So 2020 is when I started my uh, first full-time job. Before that, it was all part-time with the diversity. I started in frontline as an employment specialist. Uh, after that, I moved on to becoming a project coordinator for uh, employment programs that were for women who are survivors of domestic violence and men who suffer from multiple barriers such as substance abuse and uh, other challenges. 
And uh, then I became a manager for employment programs. But I think somewhere my heart was always pulling me towards the work that local immigration partnerships were doing because uh, diversity was holding the contract for the Surrey Local Immigration Partnership. The Surrey Local Immigration Partnership was earlier with the city of Surrey. And since 2019, it has been with the diversity. So they were doing this fantastic work in the community. And I was always fascinated about it because it aligned so much with my values and, you know, my purpose that I wanted to bring in the community work. And uh, when I got an opportunity to apply for a job as a manager for the Sari Lip, I applied for the job and I got that. And since uh, January 2023, I am in this current role, which is the manager for the Surrey Local Immigration Partnership. And why I was so fascinated about this role is, as Anna Maria said, you know, the local immigration partnerships uh, do a lot of collaborative work in the community. Uh, in employment, you're working only on the employment part. When you're working with settlement, you're only working on, you know, uh, settlement integration for newcomers. If you're working in language, it's only language. The lips really give you a opportunity to widen your canvas. So for all of us who are working in the LIP world, we have opportunities in a week to work on anti-racism, on indigenous and newcomer bridging, on uh, rights you know, for LGBTQ plus community members, on uh, what new services should look like for settlement, et cetera. So I think uh, for me, it was very fascinating and very exciting that I get an opportunity to do so much eclectic work that is so needed in our community. We are about 80 local immigration partnerships all over Canada. Anna Maria mentioned that these are funded by IRCC. Uh, in in uh, BC, we have a little over almost 20 or 21 local immigration partnerships now. Needless to say, Surrey, Burnaby, these are big cities. These are dynamic cities that are forever evolving and growing. So our lips are really playing a very big role in terms of helping newcomers create that sense of belonging. And that sense of sort of, you know, thriving in the new community that they call their home. And that is the mandate that the LIPS have. What is the work that we do? So as a newcomer, when you come into a country, there are two-way integration processes. One, one way of integrating is getting into the direct services that settlement serving organizations offer or getting direct support for your integration. And another thing is the indirect support. So what we do is indirect support. We have a collaborative of community partners uh, post-secondary institutions, not-for-profit organizations, small BIPOC organizations, health authorities, the municipalities, and school district, and more and more and more. All of these come together and become our collaborative uh, our stakeholders. And collectively, we do collaborative work on what? We do collaborative work on finding what is the need in the community. What do newcomers, refugees, new residents, old residents in the community need to have that sense of belonging where the community is welcoming and inclusive. So I'm going to pause here because I can also say a lot about this. I again want to thank mm -hmm. Sumeya and the Bills program for calling us and giving us this opportunity to talk about this work because this work is um, this work is very uh, complex, but this work is very critical. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you so much, Anna Maria and Tina. I think um, just as you guys speak and as we have our audience here, I think what we've clearly identified is both of you individuals have lived experience. So you know the stake of this work and what newcomers go through as they migrate to Canada. And I think that's a really powerful position to be in. And it's something that majority of our grassroots organizations can relate to um, as they have that lens. And so I really, really appreciated what you said, Tina, about the local immigration partnership. This work provides a wide canvas. And I think that's a really great segue into unpacking how the LIPS are critical within this space and how you know you guys serve as conveners to bring other grassroots organizations, other stakeholders from different sectors across settlement, across our community as a whole, right? Because the city may not be directly doing settlement work, but they have a stake in so many different areas and them being a part of these tables, it's you're seeing the, the widespread spread of engagement, which we need when it comes to building strong and inclusive communities. Everyone has a role to play in that. So that's a great segue into some of the questions I have for you. And please feel free to um, our audience, if you have any questions as they as these um, answers arise, 
please drop them in the chat and then we can make space and time for it either during the presentation if it flows organically or after. So I encourage you to ask questions if you're like, you've never heard of the local immigration partnership or you would like to get involved, this is a space for you to engage as well. So to start us off, my first question is, how do you get involved? I think that's the biggest question. Um, both of you mentioned having several different stakeholders on your tables. I know, you know, being housed under the Surrey Lip, you know, my my program being a part of the uh, Diversity Surrey Local Immigration Partnership. I know that there's over 40 plus organizations that have signed up for those tables. And I'm sure there's something similar within the Burnaby LIP. So why do these organizations get involved with the LIPS? How can our organizations get involved in the LIPS if they would like to engage in the local immigration partnership? So that's the first most basic question I will throw out for you both. Okay, you wanna go, Tina, or do you want me to go first? <laughs> okay. Yeah, so basically, like I said, when I joined the the BIPT, it was uh, there were only 24 members. So that was seven years ago. Right now, we have doubled the amount. We're around 45, 46 organizations. Yes, organizations sometimes may come and go. Uh, initially, the idea was the organizations in Barnaby, when they heard about the, the possibility of the funding, they decided which organization would be the host organization, and that's how they selected Barnaby Family Life as the host organization. So why is it important? Because I, the, the settlement process is not only one way when we come and somebody give us a hand and they see, okay, for refugees, there's an organization that helps them open the bank account go to the help find the, uh, how, the first house, support for one year, and then good luck, you're done. The way, so that's one piece. The RCU is important because we all know that when there is incidents of racism of discrimination, it's, they are somehow involved. Either they hear the case or don't take the case. People sometimes, being newcomers coming from different uh, countries where the incidents in dealing with police are different, so some people may be prone and go directly to the police or they was, as I said, uh -uh, I'm not going there. I don't want to be pointed out or fingered out in, in the future. So health is, a, is an important piece. The, the, so health is very important. Education is very important, not only at the, at the secondary level, but also at the university level, because all those international students coming are struggling when they access the, the, a lot of schools existing in here and then they fall into the cracks because they don't have the support that they were supposed to be offered. So all those pieces, so it's a way, when we said conveners, is because we have the, capa the capability of seeing what are the needs of the people and how can we bring those kind of people to sit together in the big table. The way I see it, the grassroots with the, uh, the work that you have been doing, Sumia, is is the value. All organizations have started as a grassroots movement. So within the, this movement of grassroots, they have had the time and the experience over the years with the funding that the government has been supported, that they are at the level where they are. We can talk about the seven organizations because that has been the experience. So right now for me is seeing the little organizations that are doing support, either start with translation, doing a cultural celebration, helping other people accompany with your appointments. Those are services that are part of the settlement process. At the same token, we have within our members, uh, Barnaby created an interfaith network in 2014, and that's part integral of the table, the both tables, because we see the link. There is a lot of pieces that the uh, different faiths do in their worship places that for several organizations, they said, oh, that's not settlement. But that's real settlement. When you are supporting the community with clothing, we're supporting with food security, where you're helping them in sometimes in right forms and doing paperwork, that's part of the settlement process. It's so we kind of see silos. Settlement, like Tina was saying, employment is one thing. Sometimes they even get the connections with the, with the church and help them with get the first job or second job. So those are pieces and also very important in building that network. Because we all need, we are human beings, we need to be with each other and supporting each other. But the only way that we're able to do that is if we open to do the ways that we can do and extend our hand to other organizations. So that I see is a both ways process. And it's a, it's a sense that 
what we're seeing also is sometimes when there is jealousy between organizations is because the government has put targets on the organizations. So in order for them to meet those targets, they have to fight for the, to the numbers, for the clients. So that's my client. You don't touch my client. So you become kind of a piece of property to the organizations. So, and as an individual, it shouldn't be like that. The individual should be free to select which services do you want, do you, where, who do you want to serve you? So that's part of those pieces. So it's just been try to make, and at this time, push them to understand the big organizations that the small grassroots organization have a place to go and they have to be mingled. Don't sometimes don't consider, oh yeah, the big organization can partner with this little one because it's bring me, me, me the, the color sense of the whole identity. So we're just partnering. So they, have, they can keep the quota of the color within that organization. No, value them for what they are, for the things that they can do and offer them the, the support that they need so that they can grow and be one day in the same position that the other organizations are. So I, I think it's, it's a process of being able to understand and I think that for my personal uh, way I was raised is being able to step in somebody else's shoes. So I think when you see the needs of somebody, even I have been able to do uh, individual kind of support by connecting with friends of different pieces, helping somebody uh, furnish the house, that busy house, and uh, uh, give them the, oh, the next weekend you're receiving a house, but you don't have a fork, you don't have a, a cup. A plate. So being able to support those pieces and is building most of the time what we do is touch, knock uh, elbows with our own personal ne networks to help the, the people, even though that would be on an individual basis and that would be on a totally personal basis. But yeah, building the building the community. One of the things that we have been able to do in Barnaby is we have 57% of the population in Barnaby is not Canadian born meaning 51% identify as permanent residents and 6% identify themselves as not permanent residents or it could be with no status. So those are people that are residents in Barnaby. So we need to support them. So their voices need to be heard. So when the city have been doing right now on a, the official community planning process, they created a community assembly. We have been, the LIB has been number one beside the city telling them you need to involve all the voices. So through the community assembly, we were able to push them a little bit so that they could host language specific conversations. Because there is some, for they only take what the census says. I said, yeah, but we have community Arabic speakers since 2013. We have uh, Farsi speakers since 2010. So those are communities residing in here. So you need to count with them. So they, those are part of the pieces that we can influence, in, uh, do they influence in working with the city and pushing those parts to be part. We have been part of the uh, environmental, uh, yeah, climate change uh, retrofit of this uh, part of the community assembly. We're part of the new policy that the city is putting in place about a communications policy that some materials are going to be translated into different languages. So it's been pushing kind of policies and services to benefit the community. Tina. <laughs> Even um, before you jump in, Tina, I do want to highlight all that, you know, Anna Maria just shared, which is great. Me playing that moderator role a little bit. Um, some really standout points is how as individuals think about why should they join the local immigration partnership or what would be the need is you're, you're, you're identifying that each individual has a unique value. Each organization can essentially inform on something that another organization may not be able to. And I think that's a really important point when you when you as organizations identify, why should I be a part of this forum? This forum, like you're saying, it's not about creating silos. It's actually about allowing our silos to get to know one another and see how we can benefit and see value in each other so that we can actually share best practices, share information, do the actual yeah. direct service work that you're saying, Anna Maria, which can be as basic as delivering food and ensuring that, you know, mm -hmm. resources are there, which I know something that's a lot of what IRSF does um, in Nusra's organization, inter international refugees, like, so that system of knowing I have to go and do this alone, it's like this network is a hub where maybe there's other support systems within that. So 
just wanted to really highlight some of those points. And I think you also touched on a lot of underlying points that the local immigration partnership can come back in settlement, which I think we'll unpack in our um, questions as we go down. And so from there, I'll just like allow Tina to hop in and share knowledge as well. Well, thank, thank you for you. that, uh, Sumi. And that was a perfect recap of what Anna Maria said and very, very imperative because, you know, this is this is the thing. I think the whole mandate and the whole uh, manner in which local immigration partnerships operate is all about collaboration. It's all about community building. It's all about understanding mm -hmm. what are the needs of the community. And uh, we all know that our community needs are changing really fast. Our community needs are changing at a very, very rapid pace. So when we are talking about, you know, the main goal of the local immigration partnership, it is to facilitate successful integration of newcomers into the local community. And as we were saying, as uh, to reiterate what Anna Maria said, through dialogue and research, our community stakeholders, our member partners, come up with innovative community-driven strategies to meet the changing and the evolving needs of the fast-growing communities that we all right now, you know, are belonging to. Uh, the piece that I would want to really highlight about is that um, we right now, for instance, just to go back to uh, the number of community members that we have. So we have more than uh, almost now 45 uh, community partnering agencies on our on board. And we are seeing that, you know, the expansion is happening. So we earlier had Muslim Food Bank. Now we have Sari Food Bank also on board. We have because there are there are such diverse and eclectic needs of the community. We have an organization that works specifically for survivors of trauma. We have both in, in Surrey, the RCMP and Surrey police, both are going through that period right now of the transition and coexistence, right? We have both of those on board. We have the health authorities on board because again, we are talking about meeting the needs of the community at a varied, varied level. And what is very critical is understanding for organizations like you that what are the local needs of the community because every local immigration partnership is working at a very local microscopic level and that is the key that how a community in rural BC would look like to a community in Surrey or Burnaby could be very different. More than 65% of Surrey population identifies themselves as racialized immigrants. 28 people arrive in Surrey every day. And Surrey is one of the largest uh, youth population. We have a large urban indigenous population. We have a large African and we have a large, large South Asian population. So for us as a local immigration partnerships, it's very, very critical that we are constantly, it's on our radar, that what is the community's need? The youth, so in some of the initiatives, our youth population has been taking a lead in doing uh, community engagements or creating the forums or participating in uh, understanding what the governance models look like, what social civic engagement looks like, because Surrey has such a large youth population. So for uh, organizations like the ones that Bill is supporting for grassroots BIPOC organizations, engaging with LIP initiatives to circle back to Sumeya, your original question, there are various ways you can engage with that. At any given point of time, we have initiatives that we are taking forward and we have working groups and roundtables. So how a LIP governance model works is like me and Anna Maria have talked about, we have our council members. So our council members are the people, are the organizations, executive directors, CEOs, senior directors from these organizations who guide the work of what our strategic priorities are and what are the activities that we have outlined in our proposal to IRCC, that these are the initiatives that we will be doing in a year. Then the council, other than the council, what we have is we have a lot of roundtables and working group. So for instance, we have an employment roundtable. We have a roundtable that focuses on all the youth engagement, Sari Youth Newcomer Council. Now we have a roundtable that is gonna be working on uh, learning and embedding indigenous principles in our work. Similarly, there are roundtables that are working on anti-racism or uh, EDI initiatives. So one way for organizations to engage with us is being participating in our roundtables on in our working group. Sari Lip is soon going to be launching something called the Community Needs Assessment Survey. 
What this need assessment survey is going to do is it's going to guide us as to what are the current needs of the community. We all know international students are not being supported the way they should be supported. Anna Maria brought up the factor of languages that, you know, languages like Spanish, Arabic, these are being spoken in the community for years. And why are we not having a uh, multi multi language support available at city or multi language support available in our programming? So these are the needs that, you know, are going to, uh, we are hoping that these are the needs that will come out in our community need assessment survey. So organizations like yours and other organizations can be part of those working groups and those roundtables where they bring in their individual sort of, you know, input in, and they are part of the governance model. I, I, I think uh, uh, often I say this, that uh, the whole design thinking process which is, you know, you design with the user, you design with who you are supporting in the community. And the governance model of LIPS gives that opportunity where you are not in a silo designing something for a newcomer, but you have a newcomer voice and a representation in form of organizations like you who have a voice at the table. Because it's like, how do you, how do you design something or create a program for something without knowing what their needs are, without understanding what their barriers are? And then supporting them with programming that will propel their integration journey into really sort of, you know, assimilating in a very meaningful manner. I'll let Anna Maria add anything around roundtables or working groups and even the immigrant advisory tables. Anna Maria, I, I completely missed out on that. So lived experience mm -hmm. from immigrants is reflected in our immigrant advisory table who guide yeah. our work and who support us. And Anna Maria has really been engaging her immigrant advisory tables in a very, very meaningful manner. So I'm going to uh, throw that back at her because I would love for her to uh, share a little about the IAT with all of you. Yeah, so we have, yeah, the Immigrant Advisory Council, we have 17 members. Uh, they might be people who has uh, just arrived last year and others who might be in Canada longer or maybe even a national a nationalized a citizen already, but they have different experiences. So number one, they get to share those experiences. Those that have been here for a longer period of time are able to give advice to those who have recently arrived and open the door. We have been able to provide them with training to do the like facilitation of groups. Uh, some of them facilitated the first, there were was a dialogues that were done around the um, overdose crisis. So they facilitated groups in different groups. Right now, for those community conversations that were hosted by the city, they were the ones who facilitated conversation in Arabic, Farsi, Dari, Spanish, Swahili, Somali. Um, in Korean and, uh, and Tagalog. So all those languages were used. And they are the ones who have been doing those kind of conversations. The, the council, the council members of the city, they just realized when they heard the testimonies and when they heard the summer that they brought to the community assembly, they saw the value because they, they, the first comment from everybody was the people feel like they finally they have a sense of belonging. The city took the time to call them and ask them questions. So that's a really good way where the people really can feel that they belong. And uh, for me personally, I mean, uh, I have been all my life a very well and pushy big mouth and pushing the people for these things to happen. Uh, right now, uh, I have been appointed as a regional uh, part of the regional steering committee, steering committee of the primary care network. And into that piece is looking at all the tables. Barnaby is divided in four quadrants. And so administratively, there is four parts of Barnaby and they have appointed individual tables, leadership tables. But the piece that I complain to them is, if you are patient center, where are the voices of the patients? You need to invite the lived experience. Now we're doing, we've been part of the, there's another table that the city had just put together around the poverty reduction. And that's what I said. Well, we need to have all the lived experience present in here. So not only one person who comes from the black community, that's the rep. No, we need to evolve because it's a different experience for somebody who was born or who came to Canada at a very young age, two years old right now is an adult, but is still at risk of a, poverty so all those pieces needs to be put together we need to hear from everybody because experiences are different 
even if you have the same language that could be in the thread, I my guess if you speak Arabic, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, it's not the same experience from somebody who comes from Asia or from uh, Iraq or somebody coming from South Sudan. So even though it's the same language, things and stories are different and experience are different. So I said, that's where we see the value of the diversity. It's just because you don't see things in the same thing. Uh, just another example, when we uh, start talking about pride in Barnaby, Barnaby has been a very, what they used to call family oriented neighborhood. So it was like a, everything was just families and very quiet. But I said, I have seen queer community in Barnaby for quite a long time. And where are they? Where are they hiding? What do they get for services? With Rainbow Refugee bringing so many uh, queer to, to Canada, where are they going? Where are they being served? So we've been pushing for that and we're working in a process right now since 2019. Uh, created two community forums and uh, right now we're just uh, having more services easily in, in Barnaby but it's still we have a long way to go but it's bringing that kind of acceptance and within the group the Immigrant Advisory Council we have members who are part of the queer community who are um, a, a, of a family of a husband and wife and kids so it's a whole mixture of the whole thing and the interactions that it, this group has it's just amazing. I mean, it's the way they treat each other with respect, with everything. What do you need? Do they support? They created their own group. So it's a really good way of engaging with the community. Thank you so much, Anna, Maria, and Tina. Even just to, again, just go back to some of these really great um, points and insights you guys are sharing about the local immigration partnership as individuals, you know, feel inclined to join and get a part. Like one of the one of the things that stood out again when we're thinking about census information and the data that we receive. Yes, that is one way of being able to access information within our communities. But you're also identifying how within the local immigration partnership, the different stakeholders that are seeing the direct needs and identifying the direct needs also have a larger story to tell and a big picture that the numbers may not always show. And that's where the local immigration partnership serves as that support system to be able able to I track, monitor, and identify these needs. And it's something that, you know, both yourself, Anna Maria, and Tina, you brought up through these working groups, right? Through these working group tables, we have individuals with lived experience. So the IAT, the Immigrant Advisory Committee, that's a strong table that allows newcomers to be the voice of the services that they would like to see for them. And that's, some, that's work that is championed by the local immigration partnership. This is work that, you know, we want to see within settlement because like both of you have pointed out, if we want to provide service to individuals, we also have to be able to identify their needs. And the only person that can identify their needs is the person going through that. So mm -hmm. I really love how you guys have strongly emphasized that, that it starts with identifying what the root barrier or issue is that we're seeing in our communities. And then how are we then bringing it to these tables and collectively working towards a strategy? And that's where you know, your priorities on your tables are established, where your strap planning is established in these tables, and you have certain focus areas, whether that's employment, whether it's on housing, whether it's on poverty reduction, um, addiction, mental health, like it, the list can go on. And so for individuals who are taking this in, it's important to see that through the local immigration partnership, you when you are getting involved, there's different avenues you can get involved in. And it's also you you as individuals see these things in your organizations, in the communities you serve. Like I know many of your organizations have experienced and so not going through that alone. And so I'm gonna let Tina jump in, but highlighting the point of sometimes we go through this work alone and we feel like we can't track and monitor every single need, but through the local immigration partnership, you actually have that support to maybe think you can combat it collectively or tackle it together. So from there, I'll just let Tina jump right back in. Just wanted to quickly add one more point that we both talked about uh, the initiatives, which where you can engage in, uh, you know, in 
in, in the governance model or you can engage in a way where you are a voice at the table representing and contributing to the voices of the communities that you serve or specific to the work that you're doing in the community. You can even participate by just attending our events and forums. So all the local immigration partnerships, they engage in events all year around. These could be engagements at for anti-racism. They could be engagements for National Indigenous Day. Uh, every LIP has a community forum that addresses the immediate needs in the community. It could be housing. It could be, you know, uh, refugee integration, depending on what the community's needs are. Uh, so I just wanted to flag that also that uh, in any that there is more there are many ways there are multiple capacities in which you can in, in be part of the local immigration partnerships and uh, like I remember Nusrat had come for our community stakeholder forum and it's so lovely to see you again Nusrat so it's not that you only need to think about okay I need to join a table or I need to commit to a certain time because depending on what your need and capacity is again it can be it can differ but you can also just like you know events and uh, community engagements and initiatives that LIPS do in your community, which are specific to the work that you are doing, you could also participate in that. Yeah, Thank I totally so agree. Much. And also we add, uh, we have added, yeah, we have Jumpstart Refugee, we have Windmill Micro Lending, let's say I'm talking about the Employment Working Group, we have WorkBC, all the organizations that touches the point of employment at any level, they are part of this group. So we have even the university seated in the employment group, uh, working group, and as well the university seat within the other committee with the other um, working groups. Because there is important, there are different sites, and everybody has something to give up. So we don't penalize anybody who comes to the first meeting uh, at the meeting tomorrow, but then the next meeting was going to be in mid September, and they're traveling or they were sick or they had a, a different commitment. It's okay you get updated through the minutes but we yes we want to hear their voices and the way we do it is every fiscal year the first meeting of the fiscal year in april we just sat down with the working groups and we asked them okay this is what we heard from last year what do you want to do this year so it's not me as a manager who decides what's going to happen the group themselves so that's why it's important for a small and big organization to be in the same level because sometimes that may be your need and something that you have seen within your community as a as the most pressing need might not be the same pressing need for a settlement big organization. So what are the difference? So you can have your voice heard. I have seen this and I have uh, studied this piece. So right now we have we work with the borough trade as well as another of the members. So what are all, the, all those pieces? And uh, we have, so it's working. And for us, it's just seeing the possibilities of engagement. Who can be else that we meet on a daily basis? We keep attending meetings, different different sessions with the city, or outside of the city, with organization, and see the value of others to be part of this table. Because, like I said, yeah, while Barnaby Family Life as part of is part of the table and works around families and children, there are other organizations. So I cannot be said, oh, just we don't need anybody else because no, we need all the organizations so that they can work together, sit down and work together. Uh, last December, we have a member, Possibilities is a member of the table, and they wanted to do an event around disabilities. We have done randomly events around disabilities, but it was a beautiful event where we mix the people from different communities and the challenges that newcomers bring around disabilities that for some people are just totally forgotten because they don't see them, because it's not affecting you. So how can we bring those voices to the front of the table? So. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I'm just going to keep thanking you guys for all these tidbits and to just wrap up this um, this point and these questions, as I know, as we lead into some of our next questions, I feel like some some were answered in these conversations. And I love that both of you bo both just pointed out that one, there's multiple ways of being a part of the local immigration partnership. It's not one dimensional. So you won't, you don't have to feel like, like Anna Maria saying, maybe there's a time that you can attend and you have strong participation. And maybe there's a time where, you know, 
other commitments take a hold. However, having that access to the table means you will always be able to have these inf this information funneled to you. Um, and I think another strong point that you, you made, Anna Maria, was that the types of individual stakeholders that are on this table are individuals you may want to get in touch with because of your work. So if you're thinking about universities, the city, the library, I know the Surrey Local Immigration Partnership is constantly partnering with the library to host events there. And so with our organizations having events, maybe spaces, these are direct conversations you can essentially get in touch with, you know, one of the Burnaby local local immigration partner or the Surrey local immigration partner to be like, can you put me in touch with someone at the library? Do you have this information? Yep. So really knowing that these are resources for you as well um, and the different levels of stakeholders that you can potentially engage in. So I think that really answers that question of what are some of the benefits of the local immigration partnership? You both really highlighted so much value in the tables um, from uh, mobilizing, you know, needs from tackling needs to doing that collectively through specific working groups, focus areas, um, to now really going into maybe some examples of some of the work that you guys have done um, in the years that you've worked, um, maybe one or two that are standing out to you that you guys can share to just show how the local immigration partnership has carried out some of these, you know, initiatives formed in these um, working group tables. Well, I will share from the employment perspective. Usually, you know, when we receive funding from IRCC, sometimes not all the wishes that we have of the things that we want to do are supported with the funding. So somehow we have to be creative in being able to accomplish these kind of things. So we have had all the time, it's just a, some amount of money to do employment and a little bit of money to do other activities. So what we do is, like I said, we work directly with the members of the employment working group. We decide what is the type of event and the group has just decided, so for the last, since 2019, we have been hosting annually. It's a conference called the Pathways, the Newcomers Pathways to Employment and Self-Employment. So this is a huge event that is hosted at the Smiley Community, at the Smiley Center. Uh, we have been able to have between 150 and 200 people coming to those events uh, because we don't have enough money, the members, contribute with a little bit of funding so that we, everybody can shine. I said, it's not me. I'm just behind the, the curtains, just moving some pieces. It's all of you who are gonna shine. So they are the ones who bring the employers. They are the ones who bring those lived experiences of newcomers who has been successful. Newcomers who were, had opened their own businesses and they have been able to share those struggles and share how they were able to overcome those those incidents. Working around a networking, providing a workshops at the same day, the same day for just entrepreneurs. So from IRCC, the city of Barnaby, uh, Canadian Heritage multiculturalism and part of my family life to do a deepest research to create a sense of belonging for racialized communities in Barnaby. So it was a very strong research piece uh, that the city was, it was involved because it was in their own interest. Right now they're in processes of seeing how are they going to be articulated, all the suggestions that the researchers were able to find. Because the idea is this, this is an active document. This is a call to action. So what things need to change? And also, like I said, is the idea is to push the cities to change the way they do, because they keep doing things in the same way. It's like, a, we know what is done. This is what we're doing. We're doing uh, open dialogues and open houses in the parks and hope that the people come. Just from the perspective as newcomers, we all know, if you have challenges with the language, language you're not going to those places. You don't want to be receiving the face like, Ah, I'm sorry. Like, can you say it again? I didn't understand what you said. So that's a frustrating experience that a lot of people deal with. And for the people to feel that they can contribute, if you have those pieces, so that's also another piece that is important to do that advocacy to the city to change those kind of processes. So I think the 
it has been a quite an experience. Yeah, so I will just point it at those two little things and just let Tina to speak on. Thank you, Anna Maria. And just for everybody's information, BIPT is always doing multiple things because of I think the time constraint. Anna Maria is only able to share a little bit, but they are they are the ones that you know we kind of lean on for knowledge and support uh, when we want to see that what are the new things that we want to do in the community. Uh, the two projects that I would really want to mention that we have done recently are uh, one is our uh, Sari First Peoples Guide for Newcomer. Uh, and for newcomers. And this is a, a resource, an educational resource, which was built in collaboration with the, the First Nations uh, in uh, the, you know, uh, around uh, Sari, Ketsi, Kwantlen, and Kekayat First Nation, the knowledge keepers from these uh, nations. They were part of uh, creating this curriculum guide. And what this curriculum guide is, this is a resource for newcomers to understand about indigenous protocols, to understand about indigenous resilience and celebrating and understanding, you know, what indigenous way of living looks like and how we have, um, after creating the model and after creating the curriculum, it's a train the trainer model. So what happens is that our knowledge keepers, uh, a newcomer and an indigenous knowledge keeper, they come together as trainers and they train the community uh, into uh, they train people in the community to use these uh, sort of principles and protocols and further take it in the work that they are doing. So it's not just staying with them. It's not just an information that they get trained in and they are just the only knowledge holders of that. They further take it in the communities that they are working in. So we have done this training for settlement serving organizations in Surrey. We have done these trainings for not-for-profits and we've also done a training for all the managerial exam staff for the city of Surrey. This uh, training was done uh, last year in summer for the city of Surrey. So this is a resource guide. This is an educational uh, resource that exists in the community. And we keep sharing this resource in the community so that more and more people, more and more newcomers who are coming into Surrey have a, a meaningful and intentional understanding of what indigenous protocols look like. Uh, Sarilep also had got an award for this and this piece is something that is constantly guiding the work that we want to do in learning and embedding the ind indigenous principles. As an extension of that last year during the National Indigenous Day, we created um, uh, a, a storytelling event which was uh, um, a community event where knowledge keepers uh, from uh, the nations uh, came in and they shared their stories of uh, the residential schools, their stories of the 60s scoop with newcomers in the community and residents of the community. What was really, really powerful during one, during this event last year was that when we did it at the, at the Museum of Surrey and a few audience members were uh, elderly white uh, uh, folks in the community, they, after the event said that this is the first time that they are actually hearing of uh, such uh, uh, episodes of, uh, you know, such incidents and their first time hearing firsthand from the survivors about what it was like to be a residential school survivor. What, what was the 60s scope? What are some of the, you know, challenges that the indigenous communities currently, urban indigenous communities are facing in Surrey? They said that this was, they had never known this. They never had an understanding of this. So it was really, it's really impactful that uh, local immigration partnerships create spaces where that constant understanding of our communities, of our, you know, of our people who are new, who are old, who are existing sort of residents, who are uninvited settlers, are settlers. It's very, very important that when we are approaching the work of decolonization, when we are approaching the work of equity, diversity, and inclusion, that we are looking at it from a 360 degree perspective. And we are not only looking at it from one approach. Another such event that we just recently, project that we just recently wrapped up was uh, Stories of Impact. This was a project that we did in collaboration with the uh, a library program called the Library Champions. So Sari Libraries were our partners for this program. And this was uh, five stories of newcomer immigrants from five different parts of the world, Afghanistan, Chile, Colombia, um, India, and Nigeria, 
were showcased uh, during this storytelling project. And what the objective of this was to flip the prevailing negative narrative around immigration. We all know that we are hearing a lot of negative narrative around immigration, that immigrants are the reason why there are so many housing problems, there is inflation, there are so many crises that are existing. And uh, we really wanted to take this uh, as an opportunity to talk through these stories of immigrant resilience, of newcomer perseverance, to talk about how these uh, for people from different parts of the world came into Surrey and are now proudly calling Surrey their home. It's not that they did not have barriers. It's not that they did not have challenges, but how by using community resources, how by using settlement uh, serving organization support and how by assimilating in the community, they have successfully now overcome some of those barriers and they are uh, citizens or they are excited about getting their citizenship and they are heading towards really proudly calling Sari their home. So these are the two projects that come to my mind. And another one that we recently did because Anna Maria talked about the employment one from a very different perspective. We did an employment summit because in Surrey, we realized that there was a, again, identifying the need in the community is very critical. There was a need in the community that employers have very little understanding of the talent that newcomers are bringing in. So the employment summit was particularly catered to employers in the community who need to understand what is the potential that uh, in the labor market newcomer integration can have. So we had uh, a Statistics Canada presentation talking about data of how many immigrants are coming in, which part of the world are they coming in, what sector are they coming in from, what qualifications are they coming with. And then we had a panel discussion where we wanted to make sure that uh, newcomers, small businesses, black businesses are all represented. So organizations that work with them were part of the panel discussion and we were able to help the employers in the audience, community members in the audience, folks who are working on employment policies to walk away with the, a call to action that what is it that the employ, employment sector needs to do to unlock the potential that newcomers bring with them. So these are some of the initiatives that in the last quarter that I can think of. Of course, our Surrey First People's Guide for Newcomer is our uh, is, is our legacy initiative. We have been doing this for the past uh, four plus years, but the others were more recent that I mentioned. Thank you so much, Tina and Anna Maria. I'm not sure, Anna Maria, if you had anything you wanted to add. <laughs> Well, I think that sometimes it, it, this, this is just skipped my mind. Like, I, like when Tina was just talking about the summit, I think that one of the pieces that we have embedded into this conference that we do every every February, uh, we do we include not only a panel of employers who are already recognizing the needs of the of the newcomers and they have established within the, those companies special programs, kind of a mentorship program, uh, kind of, of a peer support for the, for the, because some of the companies, they may bring the people from the outside Canada, but if they don't help them settle in the whole process or feel integrated, it's a risk that's gonna go by again. So we, that's what I said, we use everybody's talent, like I said, and not only we even present people who just come as a regular, Resident or a refugee, and while the the process that they go through, when they find the meaningful job that is really good for them, how they can share what the process went for them, and how things went for them. So I think it's bringing all the different perspectives because it's not only yeah, like you said, what the employers uh, the employers need to know. Uh, we and uh, we have been able to mix with the Francophone Federation to bring their expertise into all these different programs. So it's just kind of connecting all the all the pieces. Uh, we also we have been working with uh, with Mosaic supporting this program that Tina knows quite well. It's a process that helps newcomers when they have high qualification and they start doing some things and the importance of the volunteer work. That uh, yes, not for everybody is understandable that you come and donate. You have to donate your time in order to be recognized, but it's seen the positive things of being part of, of that volunteerism. And it's just those are what's recognized, not only as part of your personal job work experience, but it is also give them the possibility of making more connections against you know, deeper in the companies. 
And I also want to highlight that over the last three years, we have been partnering, the LIPS in the Lower Midland have been partnering for different activities, specifically around anti-racism and discrimination, even though we may think that incidents might be the same thing, but incidents according to each person might be, I was the first one, I was the only one who did both these situations. So it's how we can share those resources how we can tell the different stories from the different lips. So I think that's also be part of the interesting work that, that we do. Partnership, basically, the basic of the lips is partnering. Because there is more value, and the IRCC sees the value of partnering and not just acting. And I can do it on my own. Yeah, but if you bring others, not only you bring other voices, but you he get to hear and everybody get to share what everybody's doing. And that's a benefit a win-win situation for everybody. Thank you so much, Anna Maria. There was some static there towards the end in some of the things you're saying, but I try to capture as much to be able to just, you know, reiterate some of those really strong points that you added of how you know, the panel of employers is also like highlighting successful employers who have integrated newcomers in their work. And that's another angle, just like the employment summit with the Surrey Local Immigration Partnership, like you guys are trying to cover, cover a wide range of perspectives so that these voices that May, may not necessarily have identified one another. We're closing that gap and there's a better understanding that, you know, employers have been successful at integrating newcomers and maybe employers who have a fear of hiring certain newcomers, maybe there's opportunity to, like you're saying, Anna, volunteer, donate your time so that we can better educate and, and create pathways for integration. And so, I just wanna say thank you both for highlighting these those really great tangible, um, events that you have drawn attention to because we can see that the work of the local immigration partnerships is super intentional and it covers the root of what we're trying to tackle within this within settlement and as we know settlement is a beast of many things so really power to both of you and your local immigration partnerships for doing this work and highlighting the importance of anti-racism work of truth and reconciliation of of ensuring that immigrant voices are at the forefront of these conversations like we know that capacity is limited limited in the sector at times we hear burnout a lot you know we hear turnovers in jobs but to be able to put these things at the forefront of our work is something that we need to continue to do so that we are supporting the new voices that enter Canada. So very commendable. And as we, you know, approach 7.30, I know Tina has until 7.30 today and I don't want to go over and I know we've been talking a lot and, and you both have sh shared so much tidbits. Maybe just bringing this back to um, our larger audience, if you guys have any last thoughts you want to share, I can stop our recording and kind of give our part like our organizations who are in the room if they have any questions they'd like to ask before we wrap up our session um, I think that would be a great pivot um, there's so much and I hope that if builds is renewed we can see more of an embedded relationship through capacity building work and integrating the local immigration partnership in that so thank you both for being here so if there's anything you'd like to share that you haven't please do I can stop the recording and we can um go on to our audience. How do you feel I just want to add one little thing to Mia, and it's Please. a project that was funded by ARCC that we just finished early this year. And the project was about, was the Burnaby New Cover Inclusion Initiative. The idea of the project was to do co-design a community planning process where we highlighted involving the lived experience of newcomers. While we did co-design the model, we shared with the steering committee that was part of the members of the BIPT organizations of the, of the council table and with the newcomers that participated. With the newcomers, I put people who has come with had no status, uh, work permits, a temporary work, foreign workers, PRs, everybody was in this, in this group. And the interesting piece is when we shared the model with the organizations, they were skeptical and they were looking at the model as said, this is too much complex. This is too much complicated. Newcomers are not going to buy it. While we talked with the other group and validation of the model, they were saying, yes, 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 yes. 
totally buying it. Where do we sign? How can we support it? Is so that's when you get to realize. And I think what we need to do is change the perspective. The issue is organizations are the ones who handle all the evaluations to IRCC, saying that the world is perfect, we're saving everybody, no need for anything else. Just give us more money and we're fine. And what we hear from the newcomers is the other point. We don't have enough. The services doesn't fit my needs. Uh, if I need the, the second week of the training, I cannot take the second week if I don't do the first one, otherwise I will be not be counted. I'm not eligible for this program. So those are the other challenges that sometimes we don't worry about, and we have to. 100%. And I think that's a really great segue into the conversations that we have um, going forward, because you're right, how we're disclosing our needs to our funders needs to there's a bigger picture in it and I know that within builds we've really identified through this pilot right you know it's a program that is trying to acquire uh, other grassroots organizations and accessing funding right and these are organizations that are are experiencing um, limited resources to their services with a high need. You know, there's a high volume of newcomers that need these services, but if at the top level that is not fully being relayed or IRCC is not identifying this through the, the players that already exist, then we need there needs to be a shift in that dialogue. So I, I truly appreciate you saying that because it speaks to a bigger picture and how we can all maybe do a little better at tracking, monitoring, and really being um, intentional about our need, like the needs that we're seeing on the ground so that we can advocate and lobby for more access to funding and resources for this sector. Yeah. Okay, so again, I'm gonna say thank you both for sharing so much. I look forward to continuing this work with you both. And now we're just going to, you know, stop the recording and, and thank you all. If you've listened up until now, thank you.